Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to come back to your seats. We'll start the afternoon session. <coughs> Thank you. So, as you know, we have this afternoon two separate sessions, one dealing with airworthiness and one dealing with ops. If you were looking forward to see ops presentation, please go in another room. And this one will be dealing with our worthiness only this afternoon. So we have three presentations, and I'm welcoming now on stage uh, Andy Shaw from the FA, and he will present on the subject of the um, safety continuum. Thank you very much. So uh, again, I'm Andy Shaw. I work for the Rotocraft branch, uh, formerly the directorate. I work for Larry Kelly and George Castillo, and uh, we're going to go over a policy that I actually presented here last year this time, but it was draft at that point, and we were looking for public comment on it, and uh, we now have it out. And uh, it's a lot of the same presentation we gave last year, so it might be a bit of review, but I did add some background to it that uh, I kept getting the same kind of questions, so hopefully uh, I can clear some things up. So we'll go over the where we started with and how we got to where we are, uh, some considerations that we took when we made the policy, um, what the policy says now, and then maybe some future plans, uh, immediately future plans for it. Um, the background is is that the, the uh, vision for the FAA for 2018, we had a plan, it was a back in uh, about 2012 we started on this path, to uh, create a safety continuum for every FAR part. So 27, 29, 23, and 25 all had a task. Uh, 23 kind of got to relax a little bit because they've been doing that kind of work for a long time and I don't think it took them long to perfect it. But um, we're going to go over what we did for part 27 uh, in response to, uh, to the vision for 2018. The, uh, the policy number is out. It's on the internet now. So if you haven't read it, you can pull it up on our RGL with that number. Uh, in case you hadn't seen it, you can read it while we're, while we're talking here. Um, we've always had a safety continuum reflected in our regulations. That's why there are separate FAR parts. There's a different standard for part 25 and then there is for part 23 and there's a different standard for 27 and 29. And that's intentional. And the idea was when we separate all those out that there was a different expectation of safety for certain types of operations and aircraft and uh, it depended on what they could do and, and uh, what you used them for. Um, the idea is to balance that risk first rigor. What's the right size of certification for what you're doing? So when you look at the part 27 designs, um, we primarily have been using weight, occupant, propulsion, and back when we wrote Part 27, they all looked very much the same. They're very simple aircraft, uh, and they didn't have uh, very complex systems on board, um, pretty, pretty basic. And uh, this under 7,000 pounds all in one bucket is really challenging our standards for whether those are the, all the right size now. So if you look at uh, the little picture I made, it's, it's pretty loose. But uh, essentially, it shows there on the far right, or left, sorry, um, that that's, that's part 29. That I would say that probably no other far part, including UAS, has a more diverse field of aircraft complexity, operations, and type. Uh, 29, they all get big, they all have twins, they all do a lot of the same kinds of operations once you get to that size. But when you look at part 27, even compared to part 23, um, the, the spread of which the kinds of operations that you guys do with these helicopters uh, and the capability they have is totally different from one end of the spectrum to the other. And uh, we really have to think about whether putting all of those aircraft in the same bucket. I have some pictures there. I think the bottom corner there is an R-22 and the, the top one is a, a 429, I believe. And that's, um, that's really starting to make us think that whether we're really leveraging all the things we can. At some point, overregulation becomes an impediment to getting things into aircraft, and uh, you have to really consider whether that's the right size to do it. The next slide is, a, uh, is an IFR slide. So once you move from the basic aircraft, which is the first slide, and you decide you want to go do Appendix B certification, um, Part 27 and all of Part 29 starts to look very similar. And that was intentional. When we promulgated Appendix B, we actually had some public meetings, and we have some uh, documented stuff on RGL. When you go back and look at the public response was, uh, they wanted the public to know, the, the industry, that flying IFR in a helicopter was just as safe as flying in, in the Part 25 aircraft, and that was the goal. And so we set those standards. I put a little notch in the graph there. That's actually intentional. 
Uh, I listed a couple of three things that are different. They're pretty minor differences, but uh, that's really the only difference. So then you have to think again if you want to do any kinds of IFR operations with helicopters, is that right for all the same standards? So the other considerations we looked at uh, was the problem we were having. And we've heard the same problem here uh, about three or four times mentioned, which is this stagnant, uh, not so great, 10-year accident rate that uh, continues to just meander along and not improve. But we took a, another look at it. Uh, Lee Roskop, I think you guys have heard some of their presentation, his presentation before. He, he did some slides for me, kind of giving us a pit, couple of picture graphs there that uh, we had a pretty obvious problem. So our personal private use in the US, um, they make up like 20% of our accidents and they fly way disproportionate, like 5% of our hours. And then uh, instructional and training, another 20%, and then aerial application. So if you look at those three segments, they have a few things in common. Uh, they have the worst accident rate. They make up like 60% of our accidents. They have some of the lower numbers. And they're always the lower end, simpler aircraft, which I always thought that was interesting, because I'm a hobbyist private pilot. I, Cessna 172 or something's pretty easy to fly. You get the thing trimmed right, it moves on. But I always thought it was peculiar that when you go to be a helicopter pilot, the first thing they put you in to learn is usually the one that's hardest to handle. It has very little infrastructure for augmentation, usually not a uh, uh, up until very recently, it probably wasn't our articulated rotor head. So we do all this personal private use and instructional training in these aircraft that require more expert level skill than the very uh, high complex expensive ones. So we started looking at maybe what we could do uh, to affect that accident rate in a, uh, an increased safety. These are another way to disseminate the data there is the, the rate at which they, uh, they contribute uh, to the all industries versus instructional and air application and so on. Um, Air ambulance I put on there because that's always a subject. We spent a lot of time focusing on air ambulance, but actually, it, not that they don't need help. They had a couple of bad years uh, a few years ago, but they're on, on, all, on a whole, they actually do fairly well. Um, not as well as our oil and gas uh, uh, operators, but, but fairly well um, con compared to our, other, our three big uh, contributors. So anyway, as I said before, that's uh, personal privates, five times their fair share if you do it by normalized, uh, approximated, I know we don't have a lot of data collection for that, but we did some estimated approximated flight hours. And uh, five times their fair share of the accident rate is the personal private. And it's also the largest segment for us that causes, uh, that results in accidents. And what we were seeing was, is although we have this large technological uh, increase going on, I mean, there's stuff now that's reasonably affordable uh, compared to a few years ago, where you could get autopilots in EFIS, um, we still weren't seeing it migrating into the very low-end aircraft. I think the ones where probably those pilots could use this kind of assistance the most, the, the h tauses the traffic awareness, some weather in the cockpit, a nice for, multi-format display, and some augmentation, some stability, and some autopilot. But what we were finding was is that we were holding everyone to this same standard was maybe causing this impediment to their uh, installing the equipment. If you have to install a triplex system on an aircraft that's got a single engine and one generator, you're talking about significantly revamping the entire electrical system just to set this equipment in. And uh, it's, it's a fair point. And then it gets, the, the more uh, design assurance level, the more uh, infrastructure you have to put in, the more expensive it gets. So what's the right size for the amount of risk uh, that the smaller aircraft present? And given their accident rate, uh, not doing anything isn't helping, right? So 10 years of holding the line of everybody meets this top standard isn't getting us anywhere. So we started looking at what we could do um, in the higher fender areas. And this is a list of the current harmonized guidance between the FAA and EASA uh, and TCCA. And so we have these uh, 1309 rules. We have these processes that we've all recognized for system safety. Uh, this is the current standard. This is the harmonized uh, spot. So what we decided to do was, because our 39 rule is a performance-based regulation, which is nice, it doesn't recognize any particular infrastructure or how many you have to have of one thing. It gives you a process at which to assess your aircraft and your systems, and then through that process drives out the uh, design assurance level, if you will, and the redundancy amounts that you have to have. Um, so we focused on that, because we could do a lot with a policy memo. We don't have to go through the whole rulemaking process, which is quite lengthy. So uh, we focused on the system safety assessment, and um, that process, for folks who are not that familiar with it, essentially you evaluate your aircraft and your systems, and you give them a category of failure, whether it's loss of or misleading or misbehaving, and then you categorize those into five categories. And this is, uh, the next slide's very high level, and there's a lot of system safety experts in the room, so this is uh, 
I'm sure I'll get questions about it. It's just meant to be informational because it kind of really dumbs it down. But essentially, it drives this kind of design architecture. Maybe not exactly, but from a very top level, if you list it as catastrophic, what we expect as an, as an agency to at least start with a DALA design, and you're typically going to see if, it's, if loss of is catastrophic, you're going to see a triplex requirement. We're going to expect to see three of those kinds of systems in the aircraft. And then hazardous and major and so on go down, the, go down the stream. So if you're putting something in a very small R66 type aircraft or R R44 or the gimbal, and you want to certify a new system and you come up with this catastrophic failure condition, you're left with the same standard as uh, a large 27 twin uh, Cat A aircraft. So um, we thought we could better leverage some of the emerging technology and maybe hopefully equip some of our legacy fleet. We talked about fleet turnover in here a lot today where 1% or something gets newly made and the new aircraft are coming out with a lot of nice stuff on them, but we have a lot of operators uh, still using older aircraft and STCs in the US are a very big thing. That's how we get a lot of our equipage installed. So uh, we're not seeing a lot of what we'd like to see is the depth of, of, uh, of installing into the lower uh, legacy fleet. So we'd, we'd started developing this policy that would let you tier those DAL assignments, if you will, and, and the redundancy, uh, numerical availability of uh, those systems per the aircraft. Um, I went the wrong way. There we go, sorry. So if uh, the industry here has also submitted, I think some of you would be familiar with it, the single engine IFR white paper. Um, that was a pretty significant input to our p policy because we were already on this path, but we were very focused on really just those three segments. We weren't really looking at HEMS operations. To be honest, Congress was uh, kind of informing us to go the other way. They were actually raising equipage requirements and regulations on HEMS aircraft. Um, so we were focusing on these personal private air application and training, and they came in with a, a pretty interesting philosophy on maybe we could just change the culture in HEMS if we could make certain types of aircraft more available. And I know that the rules between European air ambulance and U.S. air ambulance are different. Uh, but for us, one of the most predominant types of aircraft used in the U.S. is a large single turbine aircraft. Um, the kind that can go to six passengers, seven passengers, 7,000 pounds, um, those are pretty popular. Uh, so I think the rule for, forgive me, for, for Europe, I think it's you have to have a twin engine aircraft. So not maybe the same problem, but um, they certainly gave us a very compelling uh, paper that we looked at. And, um, there were some specific things in that paper. Uh, it was very prescriptive, if you will. They had a very good idea, but it was very particular. And what we were trying to do is keep it uh, more performance-based. So we thought we did a really good job of um, parsing out the overall idea that you could add these kinds of aircraft into the tiering and also maybe provide enough relief to, uh, that made sense for that kind of aircraft. And we'll, we'll go through that. So um, policy versus rulemaking there, that slide, that bullet there is uh, really just saying that there were some other parts of uh, the IFR white paper that went into different uh, segments of the rules besides just uh, IFR. And again, um, our safety continuum policy is not just an IFR policy. It's an airworthiness certification policy. So it's standard aircraft, it's Appendix B aircraft. Um, it's not just for one particular thing. But there were some really good notes in there about maybe some other segues we could expand our safety continuum into. And we'll, we'll get into that after I go through the policy. So we'll go through the policy, what it does right now, and uh, try to explain what we have here. So the first thing it does is it sets up the classes of aircraft. And we're going to use these classes of aircraft for any future expansions of the policy as well. So you get, uh, we did some passenger, some propulsion type, and some uh, gross vehicle weight to disseminate the classes. And um, it was a bit of a science project to figure out where these lines should fall. We uh, reviewed, I don't know, 150 or so TCDSs and then took that data uh, in a chart and started looking at what is the most predominant, highest end use these aircraft are used for, which ones are mostly used for HEMS, which are used for 135 ops, what are used for news gathering, what's used for maybe uh, police work, civil, civil police work, what's used for personal private. And after a lot of swapping lines around, we finally came up with, you know, there's no perfect solution. Um, but uh, we came with where we found we had like a, a pretty good buckets of these are mostly used for that, these are mostly used for this, so these are some pretty good dividing lines. And uh, that's how we set up the, the tiering, and it's really, that's, that's our risk versus rigor chart. That's the basis of our continuum. So it looks like that. It starts out with our lowest class, which gets the most tiering effect, which you'll see in the next, next couple of slides. Um, but it's a reciprocating engine, five occupants or less. Uh, those are our highest accident offenders. They're the ones most used in personal private training, aerial application, and uh, uh, 
is structured, and then it tears up. So when we, uh, we were looking at the turbine classes, there's a still a pretty significant spread between single turbines in part 27. If you go from like the R66 to the uh, AS350 or something, that's a hugely different aircraft with hugely different capabilities. So again, we parsed them down to the smaller single turbines and then the, the larger single turbines. Um, and then the twin turbine class. Now, I was asked a really great question yesterday, so I should clarify, why did we put the twin turbines in here? Um, only to make sure that we uh, accounted for everyone in, the, in, in Part 27. When you look through the rest of the policy, you'll notice that we have no data to drive us towards providing some certification relief of 1309 to the twin turbine class, and we provided none. It's just that it was an all-inclusive chart. So um, that was an interesting question. I'd never had it, and it was worth explaining that uh, although twin turbine aircraft are mentioned in our safety continuum policy, they are at the top of it. So when you look across what we've provided for tiering, you'll find everything is still the same for, for twin turbine aircraft in Part 27. So the second thing the policy does at this point is it provides some relief to the kinds of compliance and products and uh, procedures you would do under 4754A uh, as far as what you were going to do with your DALs. And essentially, um, it's worth describing. So the, the idea would be I didn't want to rewrite how to go about doing system safety. Uh, there's a lot of good documents out there. There's more documentation on how to comply with 1309 than any other FAR part I can find anywhere. So why add more? I just took ones we already recognized, and the idea is that you intercept the, the process, if you will. So you go do your 4761 evaluation, you do your classifications of hazard, you go to the table one, you find out what class of aircraft you have, and you look down that chart, you say, okay, for class one or two or three, um, what do I do? So you go to table two, and that's an eye chart, which is why it would have been great if anybody wanted to look up the policy on the, online, you'd see it up front. But uh, these slides are out on the, on the thumb drive, so you can look at them. But essentially, it, it would be for, for class one, our lowest class. It, it steps down the requirements uh, for uh, your design assurance level and your redundancies uh, a significant amount to where you would basically drop down and then follow ARP 4754 for the system safety aspects of those kinds of systems and then just continue on your way. So we're not uh, intervening too much. The only other note I put in here was um, that there is a way within that ARP to do uh, architectural system uh, dissimilarity reductions, and you don't get to take those if you take the policy without the FAA's approval. So once the policy's out, you can cite it, you can go off and do it, but if you say, all right, well, it says C, but I'm gonna do a D and a this, you, that's not, even though it's in the ARP, and that's fine, but that's, we've already given quite a bit of reduction in some areas, and so uh, I'm not going to say no, but I'd say you'd have to get an additional approval to take that kind of a path uh, on top of the safety continuum. So um, other policies still work with this. The North Sea policy we put out, we were cognizant of that, and uh, it says you can reduce the dial again one more time if it's a not required safety enhancing system, and then we also said they're typically not below D, so, but we would still recognize that. We, we're happy to take the, the North Sea policy with this. Um, so that's the policy as it stands today. That's the 1309 portion. We started with 1309 because that seemed to be the biggest hurdle of how do you get systems and equipage uh, in aircraft. That's what drives your, your design insurance levels and your redundancies and things. So a um, couple of the notes I got back from public comment that we did add uh, is that note five. So um, it was a very cognizant decision to add HEMS to this after we got that single engine IFR white policy or white paper. But uh, we only reduced those uh, numerical values and uh, uh, targets, if you will, and uh, the design assurance level just enough to support the idea that two very good, independent, robust DALB systems could suffice for catastrophic. Again, going back to the idea that one, Dal B is not nothing. Dal A and Dal B is really 15% more test cases. And um, we're not seeing a lot of software driven errors as much as we're seeing requirement driven errors. So if we could follow 4754A a little more, we'd probably be better off anyway. But also that um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us to require these triplex systems in an aircraft that's got a single turbine engine, a single generator, you know, and an aircraft battery, and maybe a standby battery. And now you have to have three of something else to support what's essentially a two legged system or modify the aircraft greatly. So. Um, it seemed to right-size that certification, but it was just a, a, barely, a barely small uh, reduction there. Um, so my, my most common public comments, I always figure it's worth talking about. The public comments are on the web. Our responses to them are also on the web. I don't think the responses that I gave came across real well. I didn't mean to uh, ignore anyone. But some of the questions and comments we got, if they were outside the scope of the policy as it was directly written, which means they weren't outside of 1309 or they referenced some other area of our ACR guidance, uh, my required response is outside of scope. 
So uh, I originally wrote all these really great responses, these big dissertations of these debates, and uh, that's not our process. I was informed that, yeah, I save that information for some other day, but essentially if it's outside the scope of the policy, we just put outside of scope and we can discuss that in meetings like this. Um, so, uh, but the unintended consequences has been coming up a lot. And um, there's been a concern that perhaps if you can suddenly outfit R44s or something, uh, it, was a, it was a very, um, it was an outrageous example, and it was meant to be an outrageous example, but I'm going to use it, which is R44s uh, equipped IFR. Well, now suddenly they'll fly several of those rather than, say, maybe uh, one uh, S92 or S76. They'll just send a sea of R44s over. And uh, it's possible there would be unintended consequences, but the operational rule still stands. So if there's operational requirements for equipage and pilotage and engine types and multiple generators and all these kinds of things, I think it still makes it pretty... Uh, not realistic to assume that the these smaller aircraft from class one are going to suddenly migrate up into what was being performed by a, a cat a twin turbine or something uh, we're very comfortable with the, with the path we've taken although no solution is perfect to do nothing we know what we got we got 10 years of flat accidents so um, we feel the inter intervention is justified and um, the proper risk first rigor i think is, is what we found um, the second is, is they wanted uh, policy regulation in other areas. So they were looking for policy relief, uh, hopefully in 1309 or 1303, I'm sorry, 1303 or 1317, 1316, maybe some sections of Appendix B. Um, th those are coming in the right ways. Um, that's our next step. Uh, but again, I couldn't really address those when we talk about 1309. I have to just answer about 1309. And then the last one what, that I got quite a bit was um, they really wanted a greater reduction in uh, the Class Three turbine aircraft. Uh, they still felt that that 1 times 10 to the minus 8th requirement was still going to drive triplex systems. So I did add the note, but then we've had more discussion about that, and they still said, you know, um, the industry's feeling is, is that 1 times 10 to the minus 4 really can't be met with a single system, and we had a big debate about it. But ultimately, I think from the FAA standpoint, for sure, uh, I teach a class in Oklahoma City now for highly integrated systems. Um, we spent a lot of time reminding folks that there is more to system safety than just that math equation. Um, common cause, zonal analysis, good requirements, good design assurance, it's more than just a math equation. So we go back to on the order of is what these numbers are. Uh, and I actually mistakenly used a bad word in the, uh, in the note because I did say that these are requirements. The numerical requirements must be met, blah, blah, blah. And they're not. They're targets. And it's an on the order of target, and that's how it should be treated. So if you come to us uh, with an uh, independent dual Dow B system, uh, for catastrophic in a class three single turbine aircraft, uh, we would have no problem with that. That, that would be sufficient. Um, so where are we going next? Uh, the policy was released June 30th, just in time for our 2018 goal. Um, we do continue to coordinate with our, uh, our foreign partners. Uh, we hope to come to a, a common agreement on where we can go forward together with this. I think the policy would be way more effective if everyone used it. I struggle with uh, the depth it will get if, if uh, Modifiers and OEMs are forced to decide if they want a globally market product or a U.S. marketed product. So I, uh, I, I hope we continue to work, work towards that. Uh, the other things we're doing is we are coming up with some Herf and Lightning uh, policies to be added to this. So we'll continue to grow the continuum. Um, the next step is a Herf and Lightning and also some maybe some alternate methods for um, production and uh, uh, hardware and software certification. So uh, John Strasberger is here, uh, and he and I have been talking quite a bit about some other committee, t committee teams going out, and we've seen a lot of good technology where in the right class aircraft and the right type of product, maybe you know, recognizing some automotive or other industry types of software uh, would not be unacceptable. Um, so we're going to continue to grow it. The, the HERF one, I have had a lot of comments about that also holds us up quite a bit for certification. We have had some visibility. Uh, most of the OEMs have been doing enough HERF projects that we have visibility in the kinds of testing that they did that we're getting a pretty good picture, very similar to the kind of testing that uh, Dave Wallen had done years ago on Part 25 cockpits where they kind of surveyed a whole bunch of cockpits and said, you know, most of these have about the same attenuation. Well, we've gotten similar data where everybody's tested their aircraft without any kind of design attributes and got pretty much the same answer. And when they also put things like back shells and overbraids and certain kinds of uh, infrastructure around that equipment, they also got kind of the same answer. So we feel real comfortable where that might be, and we're thought about giving out some generic uh, curves for uh, attenuation to no longer require uh, necessarily doing that low-level attenuated uh, testing, which drives a lot of cost and time to the schedule and hopefully uh, helps pass these things on through. Um, the other thing is maybe we can start discussing what the adverse effects are. 
I think the aircraft uh, that operate a lot of 135 do passenger on demand and that kind of thing uh, primarily. Those kind of aircraft probably need to stay where they're at with the HERF adverse effects where things should play through. But if it's a personal private aircraft and the guy almost never intentionally flies an IMC, but if he ever has to fly an IMC, he can do it now. Well, then, you know, if one of his systems, he's got dual systems on board, if one of his systems has an interruption during a HERF event, but he's got one available to him at all times, then what we're talking about is the possibility that a system failure the same day you had a HERF event while you also had to punch IMC. So I think we can start talking about, for the lower class aircraft, maybe a different level of acceptable upset for, for HERF. Um, similar ideas on lightning, I won't go on and on about it, I think I'm about out of time. But um, I'm here all week, um, that's my contact information, and uh, I appreciate the time, and uh, I hope you guys take a look at the policy, maybe we can go forward with it. Thank you, Andy. So uh, let's now introduce Brian, Brian Tucker from, from Bell uh, Helicopter Textrum, who's going to uh, speak about structural safety substantiation method for HUMS usage credit. So thank you, Brian. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be talking about hums, but not the hums most people are thinking about. When we talk about hums, most of us are thinking in terms of vibration health monitoring. I'm going to focus on the U instead of the H in hums usage, and in particular, credit. Now, credit is going to be extending maintenance intervals, which one might think is sort of contrary to the spirit of safety, but we're going to talk about the safety implications uh, of doing so and trying to find a way to do that in the safest way possible. Now, just as a general definition, credit uh, is extending maintenance intervals based on aircraft data that we measure, and the FAA has had guidance material uh, in miscellaneous guidance 15 uh, for quite some time on that topic. So I'm going to get into structural substantiation. So now we're talking specifically when we talk about maintenance intervals uh, fatigue life limits, chapter four, airworthiness limitations. And for simplicity, because this is a, a, a rather deep topic, we're gonna talk about safe life fatigue instead of damage tolerance, which is a bit more complicated. So when we talk about safe life fatigue, I think most of us are probably familiar with the SN curve here, where we look at stress versus cycles. And based on that, um, we use this for, uh, with conservative values of strength, loads, and usage now for quite some time to determine those airworthiness limitations. Now, those are conservative values, and while many have sort of questioned the assumptions that sometimes go into that, we've also got 70 years of history now, maybe a little more, that have shown that that's generally a good way of doing things. Uh, still the approach that's accepted for part 27, we don't have aircraft falling out of the sky regularly for fatigue failures. But, well, and, and what we do, we take this SN curve, we apply Miner's rule, and what we end up with is this service timeline where we set a life limit, and obviously if you retire at or before that life limit, you're safe, and presumably you go past that point, well, you can't go past that point, that would be unsafe today. So it's a very binary kind of an existence. Now, here comes usage credit, I know that I've operated an aircraft in a way that's much less severe than we assumed when we calculated that fatigue life. Can I safely extend the life on a component without uh, affecting safety? That's the big question. And as you can see, well, if you go past that line, we're in no man's land from a general methodology perspective. So we gotta think about this a little bit more. Now, there are those who say, well, why is it that we're concerned? If we're operating less severely, why can't we take credit for that? So here's an example, an analogy we're gonna to use to talk about this because the main issue, some of the safety that we've gotten over the past 70 years has come from that conservative usage assumption. So to make an analogy, we're gonna talk about a scenic overlook. I know it's a bit uh, dangerous to talk about walking off a cliff when you're uh, at a safety symposium, but bear with me for just a moment. 
So we have, we're in charge of making sure people stay safe here at some national park. And there's a beautiful, beautiful overlook, and we have visitors come, and we know people will want to get up close to the edge. Uh, the downside of that is, well, falling down, literally. So we don't want that to happen. So we've done an analysis, and we've said, here's the line. Don't cross it. That's the risk that we think uh, is acceptable. And we have some results. So we opened this park. People have come, and 100,000 people have come, and we've had zero incidences. So we can do the math. Hey, that's less than one and 100,000 probability of incident based on our results so far. That's pretty good. But we started thinking about it a little bit more. And in reality, most people are like me, maybe, uh, a little scared to get that close to the edge and stay back. Okay, well, that's maybe not necessarily a problem, but we started surveying and we said, you know, our best calculations say about 1,000 people get up to that line. So that means most people, the vast majority, are staying quite a ways back. So what happens if we were to, I don't know, change something? <laughs> when it comes to food, we come to food. Um, so now everybody's up at the line. Now, instead of having 1,000 visitors who are at the line there near the edge, now I have 100,000. Do I really think the probability that of an incident is still the same in this case as it was when there were only 1,000 people near the edge? I don't think so. So we're not really concerned about visitors to a, uh, uh, a national park or a scenic overlook. We're concerned here about fatigue lives. And the idea of moving people up to the line is essentially analogous to taking credit. If I know the difference between that usage assumption and what you actually did, and I gave you credit for all of that, that's taking you up to the line to say, everybody is at the same risk as that worst case. That is not as safe as where we are today. All right, so how do we deal with that? Well, structural reliability has been one of the methods used to try to quantify the risk, because so far we've been talking in terms of qualitative assessments. So how do we quantify it? We're engineers, we deal with numbers. So in reality, this simple SN curve that we talked about is a simplification. It really looks a little bit more like this, right? Distributions of strength, load, and usage. And uh, what I get out of that, instead of just a simple I'm safe or I'm not safe, I can calculate a failure density function. And I can quantify safety as I move along. So if I were to take this life limit here and say, well, I move it to the right, I, I do move into less safe, but I can quantify an amount or vice versa if I move it to the left. So, but the problem is if I move it to the right, if I extend that life limit based on the statistical now evaluation of fatigue, I still have the same question. I'm still less safe. So that doesn't solve the problem. And, and unfortunately, while there's been a lot of talk about statistical probabilistic methods and fatigue, they don't answer the basic question, how do we make sure we're not changing safety? See, it is about safety after all. Um, so one solution that we've looked at is system reliability methods. So Andy just got through talking about uh, System Safety 1309, 4761 has a whole appendix on the FHAs talking about parallel and series structures and evaluating reliability or probability of failure. So we're going to do the same thing. Um, and so we're going to look at the fleet as a system in this particular case. Now we're going to do it as a series system. In other words, we're no stronger than our weakest link. Basically, from a structural standpoint, if one aircraft were to have a structural failure, then we have failed, the fleet has failed, so we don't want that to happen. And as you know, a system, sorry for the math, and there's a little bit more coming, but we'll keep it simple. Um, the reliability of the system is the product of the reliability of its components, and of course, if they're all the same, then you just raise it to the power of the number of components in the system. Okay, well, so what good is that? How does that help us? Well. It, does, it is, in this case, made up of aircraft reliability and the number of aircraft, but that itself doesn't help us. Let's move on. Why don't we split the fleet up into subfleets? So now, I've broken things up into two groups. So I get some aircraft in one group, some in the other. And now, the reliability is still a product of the component reliabilities. So it's still 
aircraft reliability and number of aircraft, but what if I can separate the fleet into groups that have different reliabilities here? Let's talk about that a little bit more. If, say, group A was a lower reliability than group B, maybe they're driving the overall system level. So let's test that hypothesis. But before we do, to simplification and a little math to make things a lot simpler. So reliability is all about multiplying out each component. Um, and that's all great, but multiplication is a little bit harder to visualize. Uh, one thing that's, that's good here with this failure density function, when we look at the left side, this unreliability, and I'm going to use Q to represent unreliability, is that if the unreliability or probability of failures, maybe a term we're more familiar with, is very small, the good news is mathematical simplification is I can just add it up. There's the math in case you're interested, but just trust me. You can add up the unreliabilities of those components to get the system's unreliability. Okay, enough of the math. Um, so, let's do an example. This is just a completely made up statistical example. Um, I'm gonna assume I've got a life limit here in this curve, uh, here in this line, that's 5,000 hours, and I've got two different density functions that I've established. Again, completely made up. I got group A, they're gonna be our severe usage, and you can see the average failure time here um, is around 10,000. Uh, well above our life limit, but still uh, uh, not insignificant. And then group B is our mild usage. Now, severe might be someone doing logging, for example. Lots of cycles, lots of turnarounds, pretty severe. Uh, this mild usage may be VIP transport, or even offshore oil. I, I get up, I go. It's a you know, lower number of cycles or lower amounts of time at high load events. So, I've got in this made up example, 25 aircraft in group A, they're the minority, the severe ones, and then 75 in group B. Now, I calculated the number. The number's not really what's important, but let's zoom in and again visualize what we're talking about here right at the life limit. And what you're gonna see is, here's group A's failure density function right near the life limit, and this area highlighted in gray is the unreliability of that particular portion of the fleet, that subfleet. Group B, you can see the line is so small down here, you can't even see the unreliability. It's many orders of magnitude smaller. Now, we did the math and calculated a number. That's really not what's important here because I made up all the numbers that went into it. What is important is when we did this, it was almost entirely driven by, as you can see visually here, this unreliability of A. B has virtually no contribution to the overall fleet, unreliability. So that brings the question, can I give those guys in group B in my example some credit? So I'm gonna add 1,000 hours uh, to their life limit. Now, because it's gonna be a little harder to visualize, instead of, instead of moving this, this life limit for half of the guys here, I'm gonna move him back 1,000 hours. It's the same relative difference. Uh, because what you'll see here is here's where they were before, here's the shift with 1,000 hours, and what you can see Let's put the QA and QB back here. So the unreliability for group B is still too small to visualize. And when I do the math, the system reliability math, what I end up with is group, excuse me, group A is still driving the unreliability. The fleet unreliability has only gone up by 1% uh, by doing this. Now, again, it's made up, so those numbers don't necessarily matter, but I think what's important is that this is an easy way to evaluate how much, based on an amount of credit and a fleet breakdown, uh, if I know this, these failure density functions, that I can determine how much credit will give me what amount of increase in fleet unreliability, a very small amount. So let's move on to a problem that's a little bit more realistic. I guess this is actually still made up, but this, was, this, this one didn't come from me. Uh, the AHS International Fatigue and Damage Tolerance Subcommittee did some round-robin problems on structural reliability about 10 years ago. So I took one of those, uh, and in that we had distributions of strength and load and then deterministic usage. In other words, we didn't consider the probabilistic nature of usage there. But we did have three different usage spectra, severe, medium, and mild. I don't know what medium is in comparison to severe or mild, but they were, gave us numbers. And part of the reason we picked this is instead of making up failure density functions, we actually calculated them using statistical methods. And we were using Monte Carlo simulation with important sampling. 
And we got the same kinds of values that everybody else did published. So we said, okay, we're starting off with good values. Let's move forward. Now we have to make up a few more things for this problem. Number one, I'm going to say the life limit is 1,030. That's the severe usage at six nines reliability or one times 10 to the minus six probability of failure. I want to assume again, 25 aircraft doing just severe usage, 75 just doing mild, and then I'm going to calculate the fleet unreliability. Now this is where adding things up becomes a lot easier because I can draw a nice little bar chart. So for the 25 aircraft, I can evaluate the, the, the unreliability for a given aircraft and I can add up all 25, and there's your amount. For the mild, again, they're not driving this. Same kind, same kind of situation as the last problem. Their total for all 75 aircraft is just this amount here, three orders of magnitude lower. So the fleet is really primarily driven by the severe. Now, why don't we do some credit? Now, some people have said, let's, let's set everybody to the same level of risk at six nines reliability because, hey, that's, uh, that's, that's been suggested. Now, the problem with that is when we do that, uh, well, first, there, what's the benefit? There's an economic benefit. The life goes from 1,000 hours to almost 8,000 hours, so that's about 7,000 hours of credit. That's not insignificant. There's a big economic incentive to do so, but here now, I've got the blue, I've kept the blue, which is our baseline case we just saw, and then now you've got this red, which is the with credit case. What happened? Doesn't look so good. Well, three times as many aircraft are at that lower reliability value, which Hmm, strangely enough, 300% increase in the unreliability of the fleet. That's probably not what we want, 300% change. Um, what if we use the, so that was a method. That's, that was, I guess one way to look at this was pushing everybody up to the line, the worst case, uh, in, our, in our, uh, our little scenic overlook. Now let's use our system reliability method, and we're going to say, uh, instead of this, we're going to calculate till we get 1% uh, increase in fleet unreliability. That gives us a lot smaller credit, but hey, it's not insignificant. We actually doubled the life in this particular case. Uh, and we said, okay, uh, when I look at this, uh, un the mild subfleet, it went from this blue value up to this red value. So it's increased quite a bit, but let's put it in context. So those two lines we just saw there for the mild aircraft, they're way down here, still talking such low numbers compared to the severe guys. Again, the impact on the total is almost insignificant. Back to our cliff, uh, cliff scenic overlook analogy. Um, what we've essentially done is we've taken the guys furthest away from the line. You know, let's take the back half and we've moved them forward a few feet. The guy who's still at the line is still driving the risk. The people at the very back pushing them forward a few feet basically has no impact on the overall safety in that particular situation. So what we will call practically equivalent reliability. But I've already, by saying that, I've, I've asked a loaded question. What's the right threshold? I used a 1% value, uh, and I said that was insignificant. Well, one way to maybe to evaluate whether it is, is to look at what is significant. And actually, Andy set me up for this already in his presentation. So when we talk about system safety, catastrophic, 10 to the minus 9, uh, severe major, 10 to the minus 7. So what's the delta in risk there? If I do the same percent change calculation, it works out to be 9,900%. In fact, as you move your way down, each step is 9,900% change. And so, when I said a 1% increase in fleet unreliability or increase in risk, that's 10, uh, sorry, that's five orders of magnitude less than the smallest step we acknowledge, at least in the system safety world. So maybe it's safe to say that five orders of magnitude smaller than our smallest step is maybe a good place to start. But that's not the only piece we need to consider. When we look at all the aircraft, uh, when we look at uh, uh, the aircraft risk as a whole, we still probably want to have a risk reserve in case usage changes. Let's say I've gotten five aircraft who are doing logging who now move over to do VIP. That changes that makeup, that changes the math. I have to be able to deal with those sorts of scenarios. So a risk threshold gives us a little bit of a basis to do so. And oh, one simplification we said so far, I was only considering we took credit on one part. If we take credit on more than one part, we have to split our, our aircraft which is part of the fleet system, is itself in itself another system. So we have to parcel that 
a risk out to each component. So that was a simplification that was implicit, but to deal with that now on a real aircraft, we'd have to do something more like this. Now, this is just some simple examples to give you an idea, but a few, the few key points here, one, we've got to really understand what is contributing to our current, fleet un, our current fleet reliability and our current safety record. And these system reliability methods give us a way to quantify that. And then when we can quantify something, we can look at the effect of changes. And in a case where one particular part of the fleet is really driving the risk, that may not be the case everywhere, but where it is, we think we can safely apply credit and having a means of having a risk reserve um, and, and being able to parcel risk out to individual components that get credit uh, is an approach that can be tolerant to changes in usage and perhaps other things as we go forward. And with 19, 15, 19 minutes and 15 seconds, that's it. So. Thank you. Thank you. You can sit there for the question and answer session that will uh, be run after the last presentation for the session. I'm welcoming on stage uh, Thomas Gabori from OCAR, and he will present on the subject of uh, a worthiness comparison between the military and civil with a particular case applied to the Tiger helicopter. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm Thomas Gabori from OCAR. Uh, I'm coming to you to uh, discuss, to picture with you uh, the airworthiness toward uh, a European uh, combat helicopter, the Tiger helicopter. And uh, our, uh, to give you a comparison uh, between the uh, civil world and our military approach uh, over the airworthiness. So that would be easier than the, than the previous presentation, and I will try to, to picture you a bit the area, the regulatory framework in which we are working, who we are, and uh, a practical example, which is the Tiger, uh, the Tiger combat helicopter. I was there some years ago to, uh, to present the Tiger helicopter itself, so I will not go through except telling you that it's a twin uh, turbine helicopter, uh, a tandem cockpit with uh, several uh, weapons on it. So what is OCAR? OCAR is an international organization which is based just uh, nearby, in, uh, in Bonn, at 30 uh, kilometers from, uh, from Cologne. And uh, we are working as a procurement agency in order with core business is to uh, develop uh, capability over a uh, defense program. OCAR has a full entity and is able to contract uh, industry in order to develop those uh, different programs requested by, uh, by nations uh, in OCAR. So we are structured normal structure with, uh, with a central office uh, working and, uh, and giving us the mainstream of uh, the main processes of our work. And we are uh, managing the different main uh, defense aeronautical program in Europe, like the F-400M, like the Tiger for sure itself, uh, but also the uh, tanker, the refueling tanker, and also the new uh, MAL Air Pass, the, the drone that is coming. So, to analyze a bit and quickly, rapidly, the, uh, the, the framework in which the, the Tiger uh, helicopter uh, should be working, we go as for sure, uh, we have the civilian part uh, from EASA uh, with the basic regulation and the different regulations that, uh, that are in place. And what I heard this morning by, um, by the director of EASA, something that will probably disappear, so make me make this slide becoming obsolete uh, maybe tomorrow probably is that in this basic regulation they are excluded from the management of EASA the uh, military and the so-called state aircraft so meaning the Tiger uh, went 
without or with this constraint of uh, having each nation to uh, under the uh, airworthiness management, uh, whereas we are in a collaborative and multinational program. So, on the other side, we had and we experienced some uh, initiative over the uh, airworthiness in Europe. And the first initiative uh, in place by the EDA, EDA stands for a European Defense Agency, uh, that realized and went after, uh, after EASA was created, that realized that military systems are, are uh, operating uh, independently from each other, whereas there is a perspective and a benefit for uh, industry, but also for the nation, to harmonize a set of regulation, to work on a common strategy to develop European uh, industry, because the Tiger, for example, is a cooperative program with three nations working together and funding together this, uh, this uh, rotorcraft project. So in 2008, was decided by the, the defense minister uh, componing the, the board of EDA to create this uh, so-called Military Awareness Authority Forum, the MAWA. And uh, this MAWA was working on creating, and I put it between brackets, you can see it without bracket, a set of regulation. Why between brackets? Because we are still in the exclusion. So those are not really regulation. So the MAWA divided task forces, worked together uh, on uh, airworthiness policy uh, to define uh, the basic framework in which we could work together. And one of the specific points that I would like to highlight is the recognition aspect because all nations are sovereign and have to issue a type certificate on their, for their own aircraft, for their state aircraft, and responsible over this uh, airworthiness management. So the recognition for a cooperative program is a key enabler to uh, progress together. Some other forum went uh, for the initial continued airworthiness, the continuing airworthiness, and some military certification criteria. So they worked and uh, produced a basic framework document, which is uh, similar to uh, what we can see in the, under the basic regulation, uh, with the different uh, parts that are mirrored uh, in the so-called EMAR. EMAR stands for European Military Airworthiness, and the R for requirement, and not for regulation. And some uh, means. Uh, some IMC and GM uh, that, are, uh, that are under to apply. And as I told you, I pointed a bit out uh, just before, uh, the recognition and the MAD air just underling through a set of questions, the recognitions between the nations. And allowing nations to understand the process of the others to work together. So we don't have here a supranational entity like EASA is for the civilian world, we are working under the, uh, each nation and each, what we call now, uh, National Military Airworthiness Authority. So let's compare. This is the basic regulation. I, I just switch it a bit uh, in order to, to compare it with the different uh, sub-regulation. Here, the European uh, defense agency work on the different uh, document, the basic framework documents, application documents, and still here, what, where EASA is solely working and able to uh, certify and to as the mandate over the airworthiness. On the military side, we still have the national military airworthiness authorities that are promulgating the, the law inside their uh, national law, but also issuing type certificate and uh, providing oversight on the industry uh, for the airworthiness management. And the mirroring, in fact, we can see it uh, 
between the three uh, first parts where we have the product certification that is quite of an highlight and uh, the continuing airworthiness and some additional I would say airworthiness requirements that include also the uh, military criteria. All the rest, air crew, air ops, are made and binded by the uh, military's armed forces uh, with their uh, doctrine of use of their uh, aircraft. So the Tiger, the Tiger is, is far away of being a new helicopter is evolving and it's 30 years development. That's something that uh, you probably uh, perfectly know. The way we develop this product as the other uh, aircraft product, we gather inside technical specification, uh, the performance requirement, the uh, airworthiness requirement, and uh, the contractor provided a configuration that uh, has been inspected toward a type inspection process and a qualification performance processes that were meant to be together in a development way in order to have the best usage of our prototype. So basically, and we are talking of a time of an older time because the ATA were not uh, used, we divided, we break down the structure of the Tiger into a type inspection plan and report containing different parts, nothing to, to do with the parts of the, the part 21 or the others, but uh, including different requirements and the people at that time were already wise enough to say, okay, let's take the uh, requirement from the civilian world include them inside uh, the, our uh, breakdown structure, and we will have another layer of uh, specific military standard, military requirement that we do think are necessary for the certification of the Tiger. This made the type certificate of the Tiger. But this this before, this uh, full inspection toward the, the, the development went without necessarily granting uh, what is the continuing airworthiness. And as always, and as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm really emphasizing the fact that we are talking about requirement because the industry in front of us is working with requirement. So we are defining them how we want uh, them to handle their business model, to tailor it. So to go ahead with the continuing airworthiness, we put in place, contractually speaking, the modification and the configuration management, some uh, repair processes management, and uh, the management for sure of the technical event with the different uh, directive and SB to be, uh, to be approved. But at that time, as we already deliver to nations their product and they are in use, in service, we do detect that there is a considerable workload and that on the organization itself, on national side, there are some differences, some gaps that do not allow to have one process fitting for all. So all what I said resume in, in one slide, the type certificate and the two mainstream uh, processes that are uh, the modification processes, the technical event issuing uh, airworthiness directive. Here, as I told you, the camo is mostly the government and the, the users. And we use the services of maintenance and training organization provided by, uh, by industries. This is the, the theory, how it should work. But mostly, when we developed the Tiger, as I told you before, it was laying down on the FAR 29 aspect, not necessarily going through uh, implementation of design organization or all the part 21 and uh, the part 145 uh, aspect. 
So what do we do to improve this system? We started to uh, mutualize the uh, nations all together, the, the authority all together, and decided also to implement inside, uh, with our contractor, the IMA requirements. So to go through, to have a holistic approach of uh, what is the airworthiness management for a military helicopter, and to have some things that really look like what is the uh, civilian environment. So to do so, we were structured in this way, huh? still always requirements as the core of our business. Initial airworthiness requirement included in a development contract, knowing that we start the production while we are still developing, and the continuing airworthiness embodied inside a, an in-service support contract. And we decided to go, as I told you before, for this uh, organization approval that we can see through, uh, through the EMR. The year where uh, I went there to present uh, the, the Tiger II, I was talking especially with the help of EASA to implement the, the DOA, the DOA itself. And we realized after some, uh, some times that we should have started this process with a more holistic approach because the DOA itself cannot work without the rest of uh, the implementation of organization or it makes not a real sense to have it without. So to implement and to change from a product perspective to a process perspective, we decided and we proposed to use what is uh, recorded in the, in the ICAO in the Annex 19, the safety management system, not seen as an operator perspective, but seen at a project perspective. Why? Because we are implementing in our program, we are managing this program with the risk management aspect. And the SRM, the safety risk management provided by the, the ICAO, is bringing another dimension to uh, the risk register as uh, already seen by uh, our decision maker, is bringing and giving the capability of approaching airworthiness in terms of uh, risk assessments, meaning something that they can evaluate and they can take into account, not as a constraint, but as a full embodied process together uh, with the, the program and the project management and the financing of this, uh, of this uh, project. So to conclude, so we are, we, we can see, and, uh, and I was quite uh, happy to hear this morning that uh, this article will be uh, released a bit and, uh, and provided on the wheels of nation, of programs to uh, go toward, uh, toward EASA, uh, because we are in, a, so far we are in a, an environment that could be a bit puzzled and that could generate, and we do hope not, some uh, hole in terms of airworthiness management that we try to avoid, that we try to identify the ahead, but a structure and an approach as given through the basic regulation show a certain uh, show a usage and on which we could take benefit of the experience also of the contractors. Uh, to be uh, fully uh, integrated in the same uh, civil commercial uh, aircraft management. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, now it's time for the question and answer session. Uh, what, what we have made is a bit of cleaning in the questions and removed all questions that were related to previous sessions. So if you don't see your question right now, it's because of that. Uh, we just kept the next one. Uh, and uh, yes, we, we have a question in the room. 
uh, and then we address the question that was raised in, in Slido. A question for Andy. Um, in the three classes, in the four classes of helicopters for the CS27, um, I noticed that the main parameters for um, dividing the classes is the weight, number of passengers, and the engine type, and the number of engines. But uh, what about the level of stabilization that you have on the helicopter? And most important, the kind of operations that you have that may trigger some safety considerations on the, on the helicopter itself. It's a good question. So um, what we're trying to do is actually achieve a certain level of stabilization assistance on all the classes. And so um, it's not so much providing a level of stabilization that's sharp, but hopefully uh, encouraging the installation of some stability augmentation into the lower classes so that uh, the pilots who are um, probably less timed, personal private type training pilots would have access to that kind of uh, technology to hopefully uh, assist them with their workload, which is, uh, we think, a contributing factor to, uh, to the accidents. The, the second part was, um, um, to be quite open, we worked on the safety continuum for uh, a couple of years before it became to look like it looks now. Um, the original tasking that we were given was to uh, come up with a continuum. There was no restriction into how we would structure it. What would it look like? And uh, it was absolutely 100% operationally based continuum. Uh, but because of the way we are structured in the FAA, um, that's the operational uh, authorizations are managed by flight standards. And they have uh, their own tasking. They're working to improve safety. They're working on training requirements and weather minimum and uh, safety culture. But uh, um, the, the program we originally came up with for the safety continuum would have essentially handed all of our work over to them. Uh, we would develop a criteria for doing 135 on-demand passenger, let's say, and then they have to go off and manage all of this uh, for airworthiness. Um, it wasn't all that well received, as you can imagine. So what we did instead was go back and uh, do our best to parse out the dividing lines in the classes to what the most uh, prolific use of that aircraft was at, the, at its highest operation. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's, we tried our best to divide those up. It's, uh, there's no perfect assured way of doing that without simply calling out the operation. So uh, uh, we did uh, what we thought was a, a very good take at it. Hi, Andy. Uh, Robert Grove Garman. Just a, a curiosity question on how you deploy the safety continuum in your four classes as uh, technology evolves. For example, what if, uh, what if an aircraft is neither uh, uh, piston nor turbine? That's a, that's a question we had yesterday. Um, it was actually a, a, a specific uh, intent to leave out we could have named those propulsion types anything we wanted, uh, multi-engine and things like that, but um, I'll be, again, quite, quite open. Um, what I've seen with the, n the new horizon of aircraft, these distributed electric propulsion uh, or, or electric kind of lift aircraft, distributed lift, um, most of their ultimate operational goals seem to be some kind of an on-demand transport commercial type of transport or something of that nature. And so um, I'm not sure where they fit in our continuum. So they're actually specifically excluded from it right now. So um, we are dealing with what our current Part 27 looks like and mostly, uh, hopefully heavily targeting our legacy fleet, which is huge and has a high accident rate. So I will say that the, the first time we get in a, a, one of those distributed lift multi propulsion type vehicles to come through, they wouldn't be denied access to the continuum, but we would have to find them their spot. Uh, and we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes. We've got about eight different projects like that in the works. But again, my, uh, my interest in that, I think, uh, from a personal standpoint, um, is that almost every one of those uh, applicants seems to be very interested in like a 135 on-demand taxi service in the inner city, which although there are small aircraft and they carry maybe one to two or three people, that's not where we're seeing the personal private use uh, operators operate at. So it's a different level of risk, and so it's not assumed that they would be in class one. Uh, that's my point.
Patek Lantari from IASA. I have a question for Thomas Gabori uh, concerning, I understand the, the wish to have a common military requirement, but I don't understand who will be the competent authority for the military awareness in this case. So, thank you, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> um, we, we still, uh, we, we cannot escape the fact that the competent authority will st and remain each nation. There is no uh, possibility, or at least EDA is not standing up to uh, take this uh, supranational mandate. We as OCAR don't have this mandate, and each nation's work uh, have each nation has the mandate. What we can do, we, we can propose them a vehicle to go all together and to be, uh, to be wise enough to take decisions together. Uh, that was not done by the past. That's uh, mostly what we uh, intend to, to propose them. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask to uh, ask a question to Brian Tucker. Uh, is is there uh, any other method uh, from aircraft structural integrity program uh, to manage usage credits? Well, I think the method that uh, that I presented is uh, a method that we're looking at at Bell. Does it mean it's the only method? Um, I, think, um, I think there could be other ways to do it, but I think the fundamental question is there has to be a means to deal with um, the contribution of the, of the conservative usage assumption to the current safety and how to account for that. So others have proposed other methods to do it. I think maybe this is a simpler method, but I, it's certainly not the only method. Did that answer your question okay? Hello, my question, uh, my question is about the, the authorities, referring to the executive director, Mr. Kai's speech, keynote speech, is there a possibility for A400M to be, to be uh, managed under responsibility of EASA in the future, in total? So regarding the, if, if, if the CQC can be out of the scope, So I think this is a question that maybe go to two years after. Uh, so far, so far the structure is that the F400M is uh, certified as a slick helicopter, a uh, slick uh, aircraft by EASA, and the CQC is uh, taking back this work to to be uh, to be uh, uh, with the layer of uh, armament aspect and to be uh, militarized. To forget the CQC and to have a full scope taken by EASA. No, so at this stage, I just want to, to say that the uh, F400M, them, you have a, a civil part, let's say, which is a, around 80% of, of the aircraft, basically civil certified, and the remaining 20% are, are purely military based. Uh, today, there is it's purely military requirement, so uh, that's more uh, each, uh, well, the CQC in that case, that is uh, handling that. In the future, the new basic, basic regulation, I don't think will alleviate uh, the CQC, but the CQC can delegate or could delegate some of the compliance finding on the pure military requirement. That, that's where uh, EASA could probably play a role and, and on some other military uh, aspects, where EASA will act as a, a technical body uh, to uh, give, uh, I would say, a technical uh, feedback to the CQC or any military body that is uh, behind it on the military specification requirement that they have enforced, and, and we could find compliance on that. But, but that's uh, not the case today. Hello, Andy Lyons, Aero Synergy. Question for Andy. Um, I'm aware of some work going on on the UK Section T, which is gyroplane uh, regulation. There's some discussion next week, I think. Um, is there any prospect of VLR being recognized by the Americans and the FAA? 
Very light rotorcraft, that's sub 600 kilograms. I am looking at my boss. Um, I, I do know we do uh, we do work on, on gyrocopters and, and those kinds of aircraft. That's part of our rotorcraft or uh, uh, rotorcraft part 27 is included in those. And we've been working on TCs. I know Gary Roach has done some work. Now, whether we're going to create another class of very light aircraft, uh, we haven't considered that within the continuum at, at this point, if that's what you mean by adding like a, a very light rotorcraft to it. Um, it would not, I would not be opposed to that, but um, we would need to see a bit of a safety case. So we had uh, some safety case driving us these kinds of accident types and usage, and it was uh, a huge amount of our rotorcraft accident rate was these like three types of operations that was really centered around these two classes of aircraft, if you will. And um, so we felt like it was a fairly targeted approach. But uh, to be fair, I don't know that we've looked at uh, gyrocopter accident rates and whether these kinds of things can help. So. Um, I won't say no. I will say that I haven't thought about it until you ask the question. Yeah, a question for uh, Andy or anybody from EASA. Um, was very interesting to hear about your safety continuum. Um, that's FAA work. What about EASA? Are you working together? Um, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, fixing things um, with bilateral agreements to accept previous work. Isn't it time that we just have one set of work for all the authorities that want to be on board? Uh, I'm, I'm not the expert in our, in our bilateral agreements. I, uh, we have been working with our EASA partners. Uh, we briefed them on the policy. We uh, encouraged their comments to the policy. Um, the vision uh, that Dorenda had for 2018 of a continuum was an FAA uh, a goal that we, uh, we needed to meet. Uh, we had a lot of um, help, but also uh, pressure because of the help and the resources are being provided to us from the industry to, to deliver something. Um, so we did have a choice uh, just prior to the issuance of whether we wanted to then just stop and uh, completely harmonize with the officer or go forward with the policy and to make the, the, the deadlines we needed to make, we went forward uh, knowing we were, this is a difference now between us. Uh, but we continue to work with, with, with the ASA. Uh, I had many discussions this week and uh, this afternoon about it. So uh, hopefully we can, we can get harmonized on this policy. I think it would go uh, a lot further to improve safety uh, if it was more than one of us doing it. I think the reason why maybe we, do, we work on different things is it is a bit hard to, uh, we have different resources and sometimes different priorities. And so we can't always line up on what we're working with with what they're working with. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let my manager speak to that better, but I do know that uh, sometimes our problems that we're trying to solve are different problems. So uh, I, I think that's why maybe you see a difference between sometimes the products we work on versus the products that they're working on. I guess from, from the operator side, what is finally finished uh, remains to be lived with for decades and uh, um, an aircraft where the FAA is a state of design will fly in Europe with the safety assessment that was done in accordance to your 1309 and, and so forth. Since the differences are so little, so few, um, it would be probably better to have finally one set of rules and standards which we all follow in an identical way so that implementation of the aircraft in the various environments is seamless rather than having to have all these patchwork rules to solve the problems which are caused by differences in their regulation in the first place. Uh, thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, I think uh, if there is no more questions uh, in the room, we, we'll go to the slide or uh, questions. Uh, so the first one on, on the uh, DJ. Which one? So the first one on the top is for uh, Thomas Gabory from OCAR. Ah, yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah. How do you assess the main difference with OCAR countries related to TC ownership and related obligations such as technical events? 
So that, that's a good question, um, because in Europe we have a different management over the uh, ownership of type certificate for military aircraft. We have uh, for sure the same, uh, the same way of working than for the commercial aircraft having the industry holding the type certificate for some country. And some specific country are uh, getting back the responsibility of the design and are owning their, uh, their type certificate. So that uh, created uh, some uh, troubles to the interface. And uh, yes, in particular to their, uh, what we could understand with the civilian mode of the, uh, the obligation toward technical events. Uh, that's why we, uh, as OCAR, we are uh, obliged to propose a system that is uh, mirroring to the uh, management of the air warsiness directive, where we are collecting all the technical events uh, from uh, from uh, from the fleet, and we are relaying those uh, technical events to uh, the contractor itself. Um, I think it's, uh, it's what uh, what Airbus helicopter was looking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we need to to limit ourselves to two or three additional questions because of the time. The first next question is on. Uh, FA, I think it's related to the presentation from Larry Kelly, but as we have FA on the stage, maybe Handy, you can take that. It's related to FA plan uh, on ditching requirements. I'm, I'm an avionics electrical systems guy. I, <laughs> I don't do a lot of ditching requirements. Um, I do know Martin Crane was on a team and looking at some ditching requirements, but if we could give the mic to my boss, that would be great. <laughs> I don't think he wants me to try to answer this one. <laughs> well, as Andy mentioned, we did we did work on the team with EASA to um, to um, develop the, the ditching recommendations, and we know that EASA is very much in the lead on this, and they've already got their NPA and, and processing, I guess, towards final rule. Um, but. Uh, this, this has not been a top priority for us. We were glad to be there and to hear the discussions and so forth, and there are elements that we will probably adopt, whether we will adopt all of the um, ditching requirements as the ASA has, the total package, I'm not sure, but uh, we will do that, but it's, it's not really on our FAA regulatory agenda at this time, so it may be a while before that actually happens. Thank you. Next question is on EASA. If there is any intent to provide short written response uh, for questions that were not able to be addressed in session. Um, I've not checked with the presenter, but I think the best will be if you have questions, just go to the presenters at the coffee break. Uh, they will stay in today, they will be in tomorrow, and I'm sure you will have a chance to ask them everything you, you want. Um, and I propose now to take just two questions before the coffee break. Next one is... Um, do you think an operator mill can get usage credits resulting from the data of another operators? Um, is I, th I think the, so relative to the question here, yes, um, the intent would be to look across all of the operations for a given aircraft type. So, um, so yeah, I think the answer certainly would be would be yes. There are some operators, if they fly only mild operations, and our in our, in our simplistic way we, we dealt with it in the presentation, that could get credit for perhaps all their aircraft. There might be conversely other operators who only operate in a way that's severe that may not get any credit. Again, it depends on several of the factors we discussed there, but it's really not operator specific. It's looking across the entire fleet of that particular type and managing the risk across the fleet. Thank you. I um, propose the last question for the session, uh, which is uh, for FA on the safety continuum policy. So I'm reading the question. You received the major comment that according to the missions performed, all single turbine engine should be uh, in the same category. Uh, why not mentioning that? Okay, so um, I did put in 
uh, like the top five or four comments we had received, we did receive, um, I think, more than 100 comments. So uh, to, to leave out a comment that we got did not um, imply that it wasn't important or that we didn't address it. So uh, forgive me if I if it made it look like I made no mention of it, but. Um, but on the subject, uh, it would have uh, we felt would have been irresponsible to again, while we talked about the safety continuum and the disparity or the huge difference between the complexity, economy of scale, operation, and capability of aircraft within 27 to be all in one bucket. In the same token, if you look at a uh, an instrument 480 and R66, and then you go look at a uh, a 407 GX or an AS350, those are two t totally different aircraft with totally different systems and capabilities and a different economy of scale and a different primary uh, operational use. And so again, we decided not to put all those into uh, under one bucket, but again, to divide it up uh, uh, into individually. So uh, we do have a lot of privately operated and training aircraft that are in the lower end of the single turbine class because it's a, it's a good way to get experience in that kind of aircraft. So uh, that's how they became our class two, if you will. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank all the uh, presenters and uh, you can enjoy a coffee break. I think uh, we come back at uh, 4.20. Thank you.